At least we have the doctors to wait for. I'm thankful for them in that regard, for sure. Any other? You know, I'll tell you, we've got several this morning who are sick of, of, of within the eldership. Tommy Haynes. Tommy has, has been questionable as to whether he was going to even be able to preach this morning. Of course, they've been out of town for a week, on, and, but he was having problems and fever as they were driving home yesterday. He texted us and they were about three hours from home. And he didn't know whether he's going to be able to preach, but he is going to take a stab at it this morning. Thankfully, he's feeling a little better, but he's nowhere near 100%. Uh, Brother Jim Fortune, who teaches our auditorium class, is, is at home sick this morning. Uh, and, and the uh, the Tammy has tested positive for COVID, so for the entire, entire Hackworth family is at home. But, uh, Cindy, you want to give us any kind of update on Roy? Well, he's the same except for he has two infections now. So he's just the same other way, he just keeps continuing. Well, my, he's still continuing to struggle. But he has such a great attitude every time you talk to him, he'll, he'll really encourage him. And Millie Beth is not feeling very well. Well, I was wondering where Millie Beth was. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Ron, if you'll read some prayer. Dear God, we're grateful that we can be here today. We're grateful for the opportunity to study, to receive help from your word to help us in our lives, to help us to deal with the different aspects of life, particularly with the matter of grief and management of that grief that we have at different times throughout our lives. Thank you for Bob and his preparation and for the thoughts and the truths that he helps to share with us so that, that we can be strengthened and that we can manage the difficulties that we face. Father, we're thankful for Central and for the fellowship that we share and the hope that we share in Jesus. This morning we want to pray especially for many people who are having health, health issues. We pray for Clyde Kirby, for Sorella, for Charles Alexander, for Candy Trice as she will be going to receive treatments, special treatments, leaving tomorrow. We pray for Ray Alexander that you'll bless him as he recovers from hip replacement. We pray this morning for Jim Fortune, for Thelma Kelly, for Roy Franklin. For Tammy Hackworth, for River Edward, Edwards as he's ill at home. We pray for Amanda's sister and for Debbie's sister that you'll bless them. That they will receive the diagnosis that they need and the treatment and help that they need. We pray this morning for Tommy that you'll help him to, to be better and to give him strength to be able to present your word to us. We ask that you continue to bless and, and guide us so that we may be faithful servants in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to continue in our study this morning, as you would expect, on the study with regards to the subject of the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. With our foundation thing from 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, I I would ask some of you to just quote it because I'm sure you've got it memorized by now since we do repeat this every week. But no, it, it, it really, it, it is foundational and I, I can tell you from a personal standpoint that, that it has over the last several years become you know, such a great, great source that I can refer back to just knowing that God is the God of all comfort. As it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who 
comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And as we have spent the previous several weeks dealing with the subject of grief management, those tribulations that we have, that we're promised, we're told that we're going to have and we're going to face while we're here in this life on this earth. Uh, yet nevertheless, we have that absolute promise, that confidence in knowing that God gives us comfort in, in many, many ways. But likewise, as recipients of that blessing, uh, we indeed also have not only the responsibility, and we'll sort of emphasize the responsibility aspect of it, but I would say even more so, we have the blessing of being in a position to try to be a source of comfort to others. As Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I believe that as we now continue in our study, as we've sort of transitioned this past week, and we're going to pick up from where we left off last week, regarding ways in which we can be a source of comfort to others. Uh, you probably uh, hand out, I believe this is class number nine, and, and as you can probably tell, uh, rather than me being able to keep up with, with these outlines, I'm, I'm still producing them for you because it can give you, if you decide to, desire to do so, it can give you something to study during the week in preparation and in test anticipation of what we'll endeavor to study in the covering coming week. But uh, we, we did get a little bit into this, this last Lord's Day regarding some ways in which we can comfort others. And, and I want to just go through that very, very briefly. But I, I would say again, and, and certainly I have as great a responsibility as anyone in this room uh, regarding the teachings that we have from our pulpit, but I, I would say that I truly believe, and I've had some of you also share with me that you feel this way as well, that we really need uh, some teachings and some studies for the entire congregation regarding the subject of comforting, of serving others. Uh, perhaps we can, can get to that as, as time goes by. And it has nothing to do with me teaching it, but there's something that Tommy or whomever would, would teach and preach. It's something that is truly, truly needed Bob, by the congregation. We, uh, I mentioned that Wednesday at Early Birds because we were talking about Job and his friends and the comfort or not comfort, and everybody seemed to do this when I mentioned it. So I, I think... Along your lines there, I think it's uh, something that would be well, lots of the whole congregation. Yeah. You know, right, parallel right in line with that is, is that of uh, how to be a caregiver. I mean, it's just one thing to be a comforter, as we all have, but by the same token, many of us, and there are many in here, and there are many out in the auditorium and within this congregation who are in the situation of serving as a caregiver for a loved one, someone who's sick, and, and caregiving can be at all different levels. But when you talk about something that over a period of time that can really, really wear a person down and beat a person down, it's that of trying to be a caregiver. So that's another topic, as we mentioned earlier in, in earlier classes, that, that we really want to try to bring forth. But with regards to some of the basics, and we're going to start off with the basics, and then we're going to get into the do, the don'ts, and then we're going to get into the do's. I always like to look at the negative first and then end up with the positive. But first of all, this is what we suggested last week, in one very, very simple, uh, basic way in which we can comfort others is just to give them a phone call. Tell them that you're thinking about them. Tell them that you're praying for them, that you love them. And uh, certainly in this day and age, uh, and, and I think there's a, certainly a place for it, for text, text messaging and emails, but, but that becomes pretty impersonal at times. So there, there's nothing like, nothing equivalent to just hearing uh, you vocalize through which is important. The phone call is certainly very important, and just in visits. And we're going to really look at that in a minute in terms of... Reference, and we will again by the book 
that's entitled The Power of Presence. You know, being there, visiting. And certainly also cards and handwritten notes. And uh, there are a lot of wonderful cards that we can get. And of course, one of the most wonderful uh, ministers that we have at Central, in my judgment, we hear, hear more comments about it. And, and that's Monday night for the Master. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've been sick, or had a family member who was sick or struggling, and suddenly you get in the mail this stack of cards that have been filled out by individual members here, but that's so powerful. But I believe also, and we're going to look at this in a, in a little bit as we deal with the subject of etiquette. Think about etiquette. But uh, just how powerful it is to send a handwritten note. It doesn't have to be one page. It might just be two or three sentences. And I want to tell you that I've received some of those from some of you in this room. And I can't tell you how, how much that means to me. And I know some of you have as well. But the power of, of a handwritten note, and even if you get a card, a pre-printed card that says, get well, or I'm thinking about you, or, or whatever to, to still don't just sign it, but, but, but handwrite some things. And of course, my handwriting, I write left handed and upside down, so when I write it, people can't read it anyway. It's the thought, it's the thought that counts. Yeah, it's the thought that counts. Well, the thought that counts, <laughs> okay. Thank you. I recently had a friend who visited here, and she'd been there, but they visited here the next week. They got this packet of cards. They called me immediately when they got it, and the little girl said to me, it just made my day. Yeah, that, that's, it just made my day. So I mean, somebody it, it can't be any more fun than that when you say it made my day. It made her day. Well, and birthdays and anniversaries. I mean, we all get those, and I, I know everybody loves them and looks forward to them. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's not just that, but that part of it is, is so powerful. Well, now the birthday part. <laughs> That's the well, loose who's, who's count. Who's counting? Who's counting? Right, Bob. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just see if there's a parchment or. <laughs> well, you know, this is lighted in the sand. Or something like that. Like, so like Dan said, we can start carving it on rock right now. <laughs> sick or celebrating a birthday or uh, an anniversary or whatever. Wonderful. But doing it on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis is, is, is so very, very important and very helpful. And that's something we all can do. Uh, to provide meals, especially if someone's sick or if they've uh, been in and out of the hospital, whatever the occasion may be, let's just be alert and attend to that. This <laughs> conversation is absolutely wonderful about that, and I, and I know we have a, a, what I would refer to as a ministry here. Sister McCall sort of oversees that when someone is in need and, and we get the word out, and we get it out via email or phone calls or whatever. Uh, but providing meals is certainly a way to comfort others. Also, uh, attending funerals, and we've touched on that and we talked about that uh, earlier. Uh, about how important that is. And I, I, I'm aware even uh, of some uh, who uh, become older and, and are baby basically unable to do a lot of things. They, they, can't, they can no longer teach a Bible class if they used to or do various and sundry things. Yet they've sort of made what I would call a ministry, their personal ministry, just out of, of going to Funerals, anytime there's a funeral. And, and if you've ever had a loved one that, uh, that you lost and, and had a funeral, you know how encouraging it is to see people come. So that's, a, that's a, an extremely important way to comfort and one that unfortunately uh, we don't emphasize, I don't believe, as often and to the degree that we should. 
Remembering the anniversaries of the French loss, I mentioned this last week, and this past week was was an anniversary for me in that regards. And, and I can't tell you how uplifting, how comforting and encouraging it was to me. I got some cards and some phone calls from some within this class and from some others and some who don't even live around here who have, uh, have that's so thoughtful. I mean, as you know, if you've lost a dear loved one, there are all kinds of dates, whether it's the anniversary of, of a marriage, or the, the, the date of a birth, uh, the anniversary of the date that, that we lose someone, those things can, can really hit. Well, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. That can knock the props out from you sometimes. But I would suggest that a, a good idea is, and, and let me tell you, as we go through these things, I am not presenting myself as the example of one who does all these. Certainly not to the extent that I should. I'm working on it. I'm trying. I fall so far short. But that's what that's what our journey is all about, is for us to strive and as we work on things. But uh, to, to build a, a, a calendar, you know, whenever we do have a you know, when we lose someone, when you lose a friend, a family member, a brother and sister, write it down and then look at that calendar in coming years and, and in advance and, and that can help. And, and, and it it's really, really can be uplifting and encouraging. Invitations into your own home, just to have people to be hospitable. And certainly also even a, invitations to go out. You know, so many times uh, when a person loses a spouse in, in particular, uh, you, you end up, that spouse, the, the survivor ends up sort of being what they call the fifth wheel, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you may have had uh, occasions where even in special relationships and other couples and friends that you historically did things with, and we all have that, and then when, when one of them loses a spouse and suddenly the other surviving couple is uncomfortable for whatever reason and uh, that doesn't always happen but it can we just need to be very alert that we don't allow that have to happen ourselves and to, and to try to remember those people as they're struggling and suffering and uh, invite them to go out to eat and, st and still be a part of that fellowship that they were before that can be so so comforting and encouraging always be alert to and have your sonar out as to whether there are health, particular health issues or even financial issues or problems that uh, may be being experienced by a particular loved one. Uh, and also then giving just gifts, tangible gifts, whether it's books or whatever, something, why do you know in it? Let them know you love them. That, that, can, that can be very heartwarming to people. And then also listen, and that we're really going to focus on that as we go a little bit further here, the importance of listening, or as someone once said and used the phrase, uh, lay your ears on. And uh, again, someone said that because I have two ears and only one mouth, what should I do? Listen, listen twice as much as I talk. Well, I, I, I do it just the opposite. It's as though I have four mouths and one ear. And so <laughs> listening, listening is so, so very, very important. Uh, even there's, there's a time and place for humor. I mean, we need to be very sensitive and, and careful about that. The Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes says there's a time to weep, time to mourn, and time to, to be happy and cheerful. And we've looked at that in one of our earlier lessons. And uh, when, when you feel the time is appropriate and you, you want to kind of lift someone up and if you have a particularly special relationship with them, send them a funny card or just do, do something to try to help. Help them have some cheer in their lives. And set up a meal train again, very similar to what we referred to earlier. Uh, I mentioned this past week about the Caring Bridge. Uh, it uh, seemed like there was one or two people only. How many have ever heard of Cambridge? Ever used it? Uh, we're all familiar with 
Facebook, or at least concept. I'm such a high-tech guy myself, I'm really on top of carrying bridge, and I'll share with you just one instance. It's been almost 13 years ago, it'll be 13 years next month, that my youngest daughter, who was a neonatal nurse practitioner, fell down a flight of stairs at church, sustained a traumatic brain injury. She was in an induced coma for four and a half weeks in the hospital for over four months. But her older sister set up a caring bridge account for her. It's a nonprofit thing, but it's a way to communicate very, very similar to Facebook, but, but much more effective in my opinion. And, and over the course of that four months, I cannot tell you how encouraging and how comforting that was to the rest of our family with all the comments and the communications that existed on, on that caring bridge. But you can do the same thing with Facebook. But again, we want to look at, at any and every avenue and means that we can to communicate, to let people know. And then lastly, just be there as a friend. Uh, I think I mentioned this in one of our earlier classes, uh, you know, that's, uh, I saw this saying that it's not what you say, it's not what you do, it's how you make them feel. And just simply being there. Uh, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to say anything, and we're going to focus on that. But that can be such a wonderful, wonderful source of comfort. Well, we're going to boil all this down to a particular scripture that was a teaching by our Lord Himself. From Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 12, and we've kind of given it a label, mankind has, as we refer to it as the golden rule. And I just, I would imagine without any doubt whatsoever, if I, without me even showing that up there, if I were to ask anyone in here, what's the golden rule? Everyone in here would know. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you, is, is the way we would say it. And from this particular translation, it says, so whatsoever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Well, if you know someone who's suffering, who's grieving, and, and you want to try to encourage and comfort them, and, and you want to also abide by Christ's teaching, that says, do unto, do unto this person as you would have that person do unto you, but if I've never been through that same uh, issue that that person is dealing with, that same pain that they're doing, how would I know how I would want them to treat me and to do unto me? Uh, I could only guess at it, I, I presume. Now, on the other hand, for those of us who have been through that, if uh, through the grieving process, through the loss of a loved one, and as we'll continue to focus on that, and if I have lost love, a loved one, I can reflect back upon and I can think about, well, what was it that others did to and for me that, that I really liked, that, that, I, that really meant a lot to me? I do a lot of self-examination in that regard. Well, that would, in turn, if, if giving me a call and telling me that they left me and that I was in their prayers, if that really was what I wanted and what I would want them to do, that in turn gives me some guidance on, on what I in turn should do to others. So like I say, sometimes it, 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 it takes a little bit of uh, introspection in that regards in terms of uh, how we determine what we really would want them to do unto us. Well, I'm going to pose a question, and I'd like you to give me a definition of the word etiquette. Now, this is, this is from, the, this word etiquette comes from the fifth chapter and the fourth verse of the book of Hezekiah. So if you want to open your book, no, it's not in the Bible per se. The concept is, and that's what we want to focus on. Tell me what, what someone tell me what etiquette is. I, I know what it is real easily. 
Well, we'll look at it first of all. First of all, let me give you a, a specific uh, definition from Webster. And, and, but it, it's a little complicated. We're going to elaborate on it to make it a little bit more applicable and meaningful to us. <clears throat> but the definition of etiquette is the customary code of polite, underline polite behavior in society or among members of a particular profession or a particular group. That particular group could be brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, but having to do with our behavior and also being polite. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I, I could give you a definition, and as many people would say when, when they're asked, well, what do you mean by etiquette? Well, they, the first thing that pops into their mind is knowing, well, which fork do I use when I sit down at the table? Or how should I properly shake hands? Or uh, should I open the door for someone? Uh, that's etiquette. Is that, is that what we're talking about here? Well, that, that's... <laughs> only, only partly. Only partly. Only partly. Well, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> There's so much more to be done. There's so much more... That etiquette is way broader than that. Oh, uh, well, you're making it complicated for us. I was trying to make it simple and straightforward. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you know, like fork and spoon, you put the fork on the left side or the right side. Thank I, I don't go to formal dinners, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, you eat with your hands anyway. You don't even eat them. Usually just fingers. Y'all never seen him eat, by the way. It's embarrassing. It's not pretty. <laughs> well, let's look and see what some of the experts, so-called experts, say. And most of the etiquette experts, according to my readings, uh, agree that proper etiquette begins. There's a beginning for it. It begins by showing respect for others. That's, that's at the heart of it, it, is showing respect to one another and being honest and trustworthy, trustworthy and showing kindness as well as courtesy uh, to others. And, and that's, that's a, a lot more directed at what we're trying to focus on here, just as Jack said, it's, it's much broader than, than just the, the formal aspect of etiquette that we generally think about. But I want to share with you something, and this is on, on one of your handouts, and if you haven't looked at it, I, I would encourage you to do so, because this, this really, it, it, this is just, I found out about this just through some other reading, but it's, it's a, do you, do you use a computer? I know Ron does. Just, just my phone. Ron uses a big cheap tablet and a number two pencil. But it, Nothing wrong with that, Ron. But if, if you have a friend, if you know someone who has and knows how to use a computer, get them to help you. Get on, on the computer on a web page. And it's, it's called etiquette.about.com. But let me tell you, it's, there's a lot more in there than than I would have even expected or imagined until I read it. And let me share with you some of those things. It actually, and they, they've got different links or posts or whatever you refer to them that you can touch on. And there's one about what to write in a sympathy card. And it's not just one thing. It, it's some very realistically practical things. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult. If, if I want to send a card, or a letter to someone, and I want to be encouraging to them, but I know they're hurting. It, it's hard to to know exactly what to say, and and how to say, express my sympathy. Well, uh, there's some wonderful, wonderful illustrations and examples in this web page. Also, the manners around the terminally ill person. If you've got a friend and a family member or a family member of a friend who is, is very, very ill and has been diagnosed as being terminal. Uh, what, what do you do? How do you handle that? There's some really, really practical, encouraging, good suggestions regarding that subject. Also, what to say to someone when you, that you know when they lose a father, or when they lose a mother, or it could be a sibling, whatever. Uh, you know, what do you say uh, to them? And, you know, we are, we're focusing, you know, again, on listening, but, but when the occasion does arise to say, there's some really wonderful suggestions on that. Uh, he has listed 
There are seven ways to say thank you. And we're not always in our society now, nowadays in my judgment, and again, I am old school, and I admit that, but so many times uh, when something is done for someone, they don't even say thank you. I mean, it, it, we've kind of evolved towards that, I, I'm afraid. Uh, maybe some don't really know how to say thank you, or that's embarrassing to them. Uh, it even bugs me when I go to uh, a drive-in at McDonald's or whatever, and I get a hamburger and pay them, and, and the guy doesn't even say thank you to me. I say thank you for giving to me, but they don't even say, it's just something that's part of our society. Or they answer your thank you with, no problem. No, no problem. Yeah, and I said, well, I didn't say I had a problem. <laughs> well, yeah, that's another thing. You've heard me talk about that. Hey, Brother Bob. Yes. That has become more and more obvious as an elementary school teacher and the kids that you can give them a treat and they don't bother to say thank you. And then I will have other children in my class. I'm passing out worksheets for them to do and the child tells me thank you. Uh -huh. That always just gets my heart to they, you know, they are so polite. You give them more work to do and they're telling you thank you. And then you have another one that you give them something that you bought with your own money and you're giving it to them just because you want to and they don't say thank you for it. Well, whose fault is that? Yeah, right. The parents. Exactly. Because right. everybody works, the parents work, and they don't have time to fool with their kids anymore. Right. Teach true. them anything. Yeah, Carolyn, that's a good one. She, as she said, in this day and age, so many, including mom and dad, or everyone's working, they don't have time to teach them. They don't take time. They don't if take I time. Have, I've seen a lot of children in this congregation and a lot other congregations, and that I teach in the past 16 years of my teaching career, mm -hmm. parents both work, and those children are very polite. It's a matter of priorities. It, it, it truly is. Um, but unfortunately, and again, as we're seeing changes and the, these generational issues, as I always mm -hmm. refer to them, and I know it's not strictly a generational thing, but unfortunately it's a trend, and we're seeing it more and more often, just as Amanda said, you know, even giving treats out, the kids just take it don't even stick it in their mouth, don't even say thank you, unfortunately. That's, that's, a, that's a shame. But then he gives in this uh, seven, entitled seven ways to say thank you. Also how to be sensitive to a friend uh, during their divorce. Very painful. You talk about a grieving process many, many times. A divorce is, is, is secondary in many ways only to physical death. It can be a, an opportunity to be a source of comfort and courage. But a lot of people say a divorce is worse than that. Yeah, I was about to comment on that. You know, those of us that have lost a spouse and have been able to move on, people that are divorced, especially if they've got children and they're going back and forth, you know, that's always there. Oh, yeah. You know, we still grieve that my children, I lost Daniel and that they lost their father, and we talk about him, but, you know, it's not a constant, you know, his birthday would have been last week. You know, it was, it was a sad, but happy. We know he's where he lived his life to go and, and in a divorce situation. And you know, and I lived that because yeah. Gary, we had the opposite because he's divorced and so the children are, you know, they're with us or they're with their mother and, uh, yeah. So, so. I think the divorce is worse even though I didn't actually have one myself. I lived with a spouse and did and it never goes away. Well, that's so profound. I appreciate both of you all sharing that. Uh, and and yeah. I realize those who are older and are lost their spouse and, and have not, you know, remarried and stuff, it's hard because you're always alone. But mm -hmm. but from when the standpoint, you do have the option of moving on. It's different in every, every case. For and certain, you know, you know, and, and it, it makes it difficult. You know, in my case, I gained an extra family because I still have my family, the mm -hmm. Whitworths, you know, I'm seeing my mother-in-law at Thanksgiving. And I have Gary's family, but for those that are in a divorce, you know, they so often have lost a part of that family. Oh, yeah. Oh, and divorce, so and divorce, my son Brian went through a divorce. He stayed with us for five years. It was a long, long healing. It also made him ill. He had uh, some kind of gastric problem, and then they just diagnosed him with uh, diabetes, and uh, it was just, it was just traumatic for him. 
So it, it was just awful. And well, then, I just, my, my, my view hurt too. Oh, well, yeah, you know. And here I was setting up for a 35 year old man to come home, you know, because I'm his mama. He was used to that. But we made, you know, we made room for him to come home with, with the daughter. And, you know, and they're still, they were just going at each other over this child. So, but thankfully, now that the girl is 20, the granddaughter's 20, they have uh, made peace with each other, and uh, they're not calling each other names, and they're not taking each other to court, and they're not squabbling, and... Uh, well, it's the kids who always are the ones who are... Yeah. Well, you know what happened to Summer? His ex and girlfriend and, and husband went to Panama, and Brian ended up going over there mowing their grass. I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I just started to say when my husband died, he didn't do it to choose to hurt. Right. You know, in divorce, somebody gets hurt. Yeah. I hurt, but he didn't choose to do it to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, a very sensitive subject in this class right here. And, and, and certainly, uh, you know, as y'all have pointed out, some things even makes me even more sensitive and aware to it, the fact that uh, you know, when we get a divorce, a family member does, or a friend, it's tough. And, and when we're not the ones who are involved, yet we're wanting to try to be a comfort to them. Uh, it's not always easy. Carol? Well, I have that point of reference, you guys. And everything you guys said is true. Uh, well, uh, my word. You know, it's just unimaginable how painful that can be, I'm certain. But there again, this, this particular webpage, of all places under etiquette, how, you know, what are some sensitive ways uh, to, to be sensitive and comforting to someone uh, during a divorce? How to write a get well letter. Uh, and there, there can be more to it than this get well. But uh, there's some really wonderful suggestions on that in, in here. And my, also, what to wear at a funeral. And here again, I'm telling you about my personal attitude about this. Uh, you know, historically, for years and years, uh, the formality of a, of a funeral, you wore black. You wore black clothing to a funeral. Well, that's no longer the case. But I can tell you, I recently was at a, at a funeral right here at this building. An individual came in, he had on Bermuda shorts and flip-flops. Well, at least he came to the funeral. I've got to give him credit for that. But let's, let's be as respectful as we can. And, and again, this particular webpage of all things has some comments on, on some suggestions on what to wear to a funeral. That doesn't mean you have to have a few coat and tie or anything like that, but, but to be respectful. Well, Bob, so often people come to funerals now from work, you know, if you're, if yeah. so many of them are during the week that, that people will take off work, run to the funeral, and, and run back to work. And so I, I'm like you. It means more that they're there than whether they're there at work clothes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good point. But Good you point. can wear something a little nicer to work in most cases. Well, well I didn't have to wear Bermuda shorts. Or bring a jacket with you or put on shoes. Yeah, all those things. Or um, a long pants. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. There's no excuse for uh, that, really. Well, he wasn't at work if he was in Bermuda shorts and flip flops. I can tell you that. Right? Right. Unless he's a lifeguard somewhere, I don't know. Anyway. Do you know what I'm sensing from this conversation? I don't think I'm the only one in here. We're all on public. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, it depends on where you are. I recently went to a funeral for a friend of mine in Tennessee, and I'm there were probably 500 people there, and I was one of the three people that was in a dress that wasn't black. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is black. All the family was in black. I was really out of place because I had on an orange top and a flowery skirt. <laughs> 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 we could see you, couldn't we? Uh, they could see me. They I can just imagine that. what they were saying about you. <laughs> <laughs> She's not from Tennessee. Where did she get that outfit? <laughs> 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 <laughs
but we want to respect the family and, and their preference and their choice, for sure. And that's really what it's all about in, in going to the funeral, to try to show respect and love for, for the, the family. Well, we're as usual I'm about out of time here. There's a printout if you didn't get it. Have, have any of you from, already familiar with the parable of the twins? Now that's in the sixth chapter of the text. Right? <laughs> now, what, what is the parable? Story. A story? Uh, just any kind of story? Is, is it many times, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That's what it is. But in terms of when Jesus taught his disciples via parables, he would use earthly uh, objects and earthly signs to try to communicate a spiritual thought and a spiritual teaching. And we've got Phil in the Gospels. Uh, numbers and numbers of parables. I haven't counted them. But anyway, this parable of the twins, which I, I'd encourage you to take it, read it. Uh, we'll talk about it, uh, Lord willing, this, this next Sunday, but uh, they don't even know who the author is. I, I learned of this through, again, a book. Uh, uh, I read one of the books that was written by Tom and Roy Williams. Uh, but it, it's it's pretty profound when you really read it and really think about it, or at least, at least it was to me, as it pertained to these two twins, as they were unborn, they were still within their mother's womb. Let me read it just real quickly. We, we had the second buzzer and buzz yet. Once upon a time, twin boys were conceived in the same womb. Weeks passed and the twins developed. As their awareness grew, they laughed for joy. Isn't it great that we were conceived? Isn't it great to be alive? Well, together the twins explored their world. Now again, they're in the mother's womb. When they found their mother's cord that gave them life, they sang for joy. How great is our mother's love that she shares her own life with us. As weeks stretched into months, the twins noticed how much each was changing. What does it mean, asked the one. Well, it means that our stay in this world is drawing to an end said the other one. Now again, this, the parallel has to do with our life here on this earth. I'm, I'm sure you've already picked up on that. Uh, but the other twin said, but I don't want to go, said the one. I want to stay here, always. Well, we have no choice, said the other. But maybe there is life after birth. But how can that be, responded the one. We will shed our life cord, and how is life possible without it? Besides, we have seen evidence that others were here before us, and none of them have returned to tell us that there is life after birth. No, this is the end. And so the one fell into deep despair, saying, Well, if conception ends in birth, what is the purpose of life in the womb? It's meaningless. Maybe there is no mother after all. But there has to be, protested the other. How else did we get here? How do we remain alive? Have you ever seen our mother, said the one? Well, maybe she lives only in our minds. Maybe we made her up because the idea made us feel so good. And so the last days of the one were filled with deep questioning and fear. Finally, the moment of birth arrived. When the twins passed from this world, they opened their eyes and they cried for what they saw exceeded their fondest dreams. And we, we can just parallel that. And, and I'm going to have some comments next week about atheism. And atheist, but, uh, an atheist, uh, again, there will be, have you ever heard the statement, there will be no atheists on the day of judgment? There will not be. Thank you very much for your comments. Sir.